Las Vegas massacre. Like, why are there people laying on the ground? The latest in the ongoing investigation after Sunday night's mass shooting. We remember some of the victims. Rebuilding Puerto Rico. President Trump visits the island and surveys destruction left by Hurricane Maria. 20-week abortion ban. Lawmakers debate a bill making abortion illegal after the point when scientists say babies feel pain. And on Capitol Hill, Christians in Iraq are on the brink of extinction. My testimony before Congress on the plight of Christians in Iraq. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, October 3rd, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. Vigils are being held across the country to mourn the victims of the Las Vegas massacre. Police say Stephen Paddock killed 59 people and injured more than 500 others when he opened fire on a country music concert. When officers arrived at the shooter's hotel room, he apparently started firing through the door, forcing a SWAT team to break in. When they entered, authorities say he was dead. As investigators try to determine the motive for murder, people are paying tribute to the lives that were lost. Popular landmarks across the world have gone dark to honor the victims of the deadly attack. But in Las Vegas, candles shine bright against the night sky. The lights represent love for the lives lost during a country music concert. Among the dead, Rachel Parker, a records technician for a California police department. She was a true professional and just a truly nice person. Sonny Melton was a registered nurse from Tennessee who died protecting his wife. He went out protecting Heather. Um, that shows his true self in his last moments of life. He was protecting other people like he would do every day. Angie Gomez graduated high school two years ago. The cheerleader was involved in the choir and loved to act. 20-year-old Bailey Schweitzer was with her mom when she was shot and killed. Had a heart for people. Bailey was there for everybody. Jennifer Irvine was a San Diego attorney passionate about helping people. Rhonda LaRoque was a Massachusetts mom who loved country music. Nisa Tonks had three boys. Jenny Parks, a mother of two, was a California kindergarten teacher. Susan Smith, a 53-year-old mother and office manager for a California elementary school. Susan's been with us a long time. She's wonderful, um, very well loved. Sandra Casey taught special education for a California middle school. We lost a person today who, who will not be replaced. She, she, she's in the hearts forever. Many hospitals in the Las Vegas area say they are overflowing with patients. And although ISIS claimed responsibility yesterday, the FBI discounts the possibility of international terrorism. President Trump will travel to Las Vegas tomorrow, but today he toured Puerto Rico to see firsthand hurricane recovery efforts. White House correspondent Mark Irons is reporting. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. The president shares his thoughts about the response to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. He is praising the federal relief efforts, but says local Puerto Rican officials have to, quote, give us more help. Now, I hate to tell you, Puerto Rico, but you've thrown our budget a little out of whack because we've spent a lot of money on Puerto Rico, and that's fine. We've saved a lot of lives. The president scolding Puerto Rico, but pledging to continue to help the U.S. territory torn apart by Hurricane Maria. Mr. Trump and the First Lady are on the ground to see how relief efforts are going. It's been nearly two weeks since the disaster knocked out power to most of the island's 3.4 million people and left at least 16 people dead. But the president says it could be worse. 16 people versus in the thousands. Uh, you can be very proud of all of your people, all of our people working together. Trump's unifying tone comes after he called critics of the U.S. federal response politically motivated ingrates over the weekend. Today he met with one of those critics, the mayor of San Juan, and the president also met with survivors. So were you in the house when it was happening? Yes, we were. And what did you think? Did you think that was the end, or what did you think? No. Actually, we, we know the structure will hold. As the recovery efforts continue, the Archbishop of San Juan is encouraging Catholics there, saying, united to Christ, our life can give many fruits, avoiding pessimism and encouraging hope. 
According to FEMA, there are more than 10,000 federal officials in Puerto Rico. The president handed out flashlights at a church today. 95% of electricity customers on the island remain without power. Lauren. Mark, what are the president's critics saying about the federal response? The main critic, the mayor of San Juan, just a few days ago, referenced the Trump administration response, saying, you are killing us with inefficiency. And one international relief group, Oxfam, says it's taking the rare step of intervening in this American disaster. Oxfam cites its outrage over what it calls a slow and inadequate response. Correspondent Mark Irons at the White House. Thank you, Mark. President Trump has made additional disaster assistance available to Florida after the destruction from Hurricane Irma. Under the order, direct federal assistance has increased from 75 percent of the cost of debris removal to 90 percent. Time is running out for persecuted Christians and other religious minorities in Iraq and Syria who have been threatened by ISIS. I saw that firsthand earlier this year in Iraq and described my experiences today on Capitol Hill to lawmakers. They question why the State Department and USAID haven't released money earmarked to help them. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby was there and joins us now from Capitol Hill. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Genocide is the word we keep hearing today to describe what's been happening to religious and ethnic minorities in Iraq and Syria. It's scary to think about how much people in that part of the world have had to endure, but today we heard from one woman who has lived it firsthand. There are many Yazidis in captivity still. We will not stop until we reach their voice to everyone we can to help them out. It's difficult for Shireen Ibrahim to talk about the trauma she suffered. For eight months, ISIS held her prisoner near Sinjar in Iraq. She is a Yazidi, a Kurdish religious minority. Uh, in Syria, I was tortured. Now Shireen is asking U.S. lawmakers to help her people. She showed us pictures of 19 family members who are still missing. But Yazidis aren't the only ones under attack. While status reports from the UNDP work in Nineveh purport to show real progress in the Christian majority towns, on the ground we see little evidence of it. Stephen Rasha with the Archdiocese of Erbil, Iraq, which is housing thousands of refugees, says they need help to keep their doors open. Despite the U.S. government declaring a genocide against Christians and Yazidis in March of last year, those groups have not received any federal aid. This action begs the question of why the State Department, which has distributed over $220 million in humanitarian assist assistance in Iraq since 2014, has consistently ignored the dire needs of the persecuted minorities in Iraq. <laughs> Highlighting the destruction was our own Lauren Ashburn. She described what she saw during our team's trip to Iraq in April. A statue of the Virgin Mary is decapitated. Other statues are smashed to bits. The face of Jesus had been ripped off from paintings. Bullet holes mark the place where a cross once hung. Every Christian symbol I could see had been defaced or obliterated. I could not hold back my tears. And neither could Shireen. Today her emotions were raw as she made her plea to Congress. And Lauren, as you know, that moment when Shireen shed tears was emotional for everyone in the room. Even though we don't speak the same language, we all knew what she was feeling. That translator would go on to say captivity under ISIS was like hell. Lauren. It was very, very powerful. You're right, Wyatt. Representative Chris Smith, who led the hearing and invited me to testify, put a bill forward one year ago, Wyatt, and it would bring direct aid to Christians and Yazidis. It has been stuck in the Senate. Yes, that's right, Lauren. We're talking about a bill called H.R. 390, which passed the House and it got even out of a, a committee in the Senate. But at this point, it's been held up for a floor vote, which is the next step. So today, Representative Chris Smith called the Senate again, asking why it hasn't been brought yet to a vote. If both the Senate and the House pass this bill, the president has agreed. He says he will sign it. Lauren? The delay really does seem inexplicable. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from Capitol Hill. Thank you, Wyatt. Majority Whip Steve Scalise is back on Capitol Hill today, and during a weekly Republican press conference, he encouraged Americans to pray for victims of the tragedy in Las Vegas. Obviously, uh, with so much loss of life and so many other people that are still injured today, uh, those families need our prayers right now. They need to be uplifted. 
Scalise was shot in June at a congressional baseball practice. Last week, he returned to the Capitol for the first time since that shooting. Unborn babies inspire passionate debate today at the House of Representatives as lawmakers consider a bill to ban most abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi reports. These are little boys and little girls waiting to be born. The House debates a bill to ban most abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. We can all have a conversation about the logic and the science underlying the bill, but, um, you know, I, I, I think it's just absolutely a common sense, the right thing to do and not political theater. The bill would still allow abortions for rape, incest, or to save the life of the mother. But Democrats again and again brought up what's not exempted, birth so defects. Let's talk about pain here today. Let's talk about Leslie and her husband, who found out that they were pregnant and were thrilled. And unfortunately, the pregnancy did not go well. But other lawmakers spoke personally about their own path to parenthood. I'll never forget listening to the heartbeat of my first child, Nathan. I cried all the way to the car, praising God for this miracle. H.R. 36 is called the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. The first few pages lay out the argument that unborn children after 20 weeks of pregnancy can feel pain. It's long past time for our country to uh, recognize what is happening to these unborn children and to do all that we can to protect them. Abortion researchers at the Guttmacher Institute say 19 states already have 20-week abortion bans. And today, Congressman Way making it nationwide. A blatant attempt to chip away at a woman's right to choose. Each human life should be protected under the rule of law. Each life that feels pain should be free from being tortured. Across the Capitol, pro-lifers learn the theme for next year's March for Life, Love Saves Lives. Organizer Jeannie Mancini wants an end to all abortions, but she says this bill is a good start. It'll save lives with an estimated 11,000 every year. Um, we still will have a, a long way to go, but this, this moves in the right direction without a doubt. The White House again said this week President Trump would sign the bill, a promise he made on the campaign trail. But even if it passes the House tonight, the bill will likely die in the Senate not able to get the needed 60 votes. At the Capitol, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. A district judge in Iowa upholds a new pro-life law requiring a three-day waiting period for abortions. The judge says the law doesn't place an undue burden on women. Missouri and South Dakota currently have three-day waiting periods for abortions. The Pentagon announces the death of an American soldier killed in Iraq. Specialist Alexander Misseldine of Tyler, Texas, died Sunday in the Nineveh province. The soldier was injured when an IED detonated near his convoy. Seventeen members of the St. Vincent de Paul Society die in a roadside accident Saturday in Zambia. Forty-two others were injured. The members had just celebrated the 400th anniversary of the society. The Vatican's Secretary of State is headlining an international conference in Rome on protecting children from online sexual abuse. It comes just weeks after he recalled one of his diplomats caught up in a U.S.-Canadian investigation into child pornography. Our Vatican correspondent, Juliette Lindley, was there and reports from Rome. Lauren, when we're talking about online child sex abuse, we're looking at all forms of digital molestation, including interaction on mobile phones, playing video games, and on social media. And the forms of abuse can come in the form of cyberbullying, sexual exploitation, sexual abuse, and grooming, a term which means when sex predators pretend that they are the friends of the children. The Vatican's point man for child sex abuse has gathered researchers in public health, law enforcement and government from all over the world. The goal is develop good online practices and Father Hans Zollner says the church's policy is zero tolerance. Every person who has committed a crime needs to be tried and if found guilty will be also convicted. So uh, of course there is no, no uh, excuse for that who harms children needs to be punished, full stop. 
Organizers say over 800 million young people are digital natives. In other words, they're growing up with technology. These students remember well the online risks they faced as teens, including cyberbullying. When you're seeing a group against you with all the people writing anonymously or posting your photos with, with evil comments, you really don't know how to stop it, how to prevent even those things. It's so easy for them to get pictures they're not supposed to see, like of violins and of um, yeah, pornography, of things they shouldn't see. So uh, there has to be a, a way of yeah, protecting them. Cardinal Pietro Parolin, the Vatican's Secretary of State, will deliver the keynote address on the Holy See's commitment to fighting online sex abuse. And later this week, participants will present Pope Francis with a list of proposals. But Lauren, prevention of sex abuse online starts at home. We need to tell our kids, don't give out personal information like your home number, your address or your email. Don't open messages from people you don't know. Don't go out and meet someone that you've only met online. Don't trust people online, they often lie. And don't be secretive. Tell your parents if there's anything going on that makes you uncomfortable when you're on the web. Lauren. Thank you, Juliet Lindley. Coming up, one-on-one -on -one with Cardinal Joseph Zen, the Bishop Emeritus of Hong Kong, criticizes the Pope on China policy. Pope Francis is inviting Christians to turn to God, to search for courage and strength to follow Jesus. During Mass this morning, the Holy Father reflected on Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and on accepting the will of his father. A Salesian priest killed in the 60s is one step closer to becoming a saint. Father Titus Zeman was beatified Saturday in Slovakia. Zeman died in 1969 after being sent to prison because of his faith. On Sunday, Pope Francis prayed for the martyr to sustain us in the most difficult moments of life. Beatification is the last step before sainthood. The Chinese government is revising its rules on religious affairs. The Communist Party of China is atheist, and the practice of religion is effectively banned. New regulations will supposedly protect freedom of religion for its citizens. The Chinese government says the management of religious affairs should adhere to the principle of protecting legitimate religious activities while curbing and preventing illegal and extreme practices. These new regulations go into effect next year. I had the opportunity to talk to a Chinese Catholic leader the other day. He says China is only cracking down more on religious freedom. Cardinal Joseph Zen, Emeritus Bishop of Hong Kong, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for joining us. I understand you're on a tour in the United States visiting Chinese communities. But first, tell me about whether or not you think that these regulations will protect citizens' freedom of expression. Uh, I have to abstain from laughing <laughs> because, uh, uh, you know, we Chinese, we are uh, uh, masters in playing with words, you know. And uh, the government says very nice things, uh, but uh, in reality, uh, from... Uh, uh, the first reading of the, the so-called new regulation, the impression is very clear that is that they are going to tighten the control. The Vatican doesn't provide estimates of Catholic population, but it's about 9 to 10 million, according to the Holy Spirit Center in, in Hong Kong, and that's out of a population of 1.3 billion. How does the Catholic community grow under such duress? It's not about uh, the number, but about the, the situation. Uh, I think uh, uh, the faith uh, has to be lived uh, authentically. And uh, if you uh, change the nature of that faith, uh, then the number is not that important. But how, how can that happen when you have 1,300 underground priests? They can still survive. Huh? I, I, I mean, uh, we have still uh, much healthy uh, strength, uh, even in the underground, both in the underground and in the underground, uh, in spite of the, the tight policy of the government. Huh? Uh, so 
you, you, you may not imagine that uh, in some places uh, we have uh, churches in the, in the ground, uh, even of uh, capacity of uh, 1,000. But why doesn't the government crack down on that? Yeah, uh, because they are not, they are not stupid. Huh? They, they know that those are good people, they are good citizens, they are not going to make any revolution. They are just uh, uh, want to live their faith. Recently, there has been a Vatican deal with Beijing. You say that this deal would betray Christ. Why? Actually, uh, I correct that expression. I did say that the Pope would betray Jesus Christ. I said uh, the people in China would feel betrayed. The agreement, as far as I can know, because uh, uh, I, I have no direct information from the Vatican anymore, and uh, from what I can know, it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal. Why? Because uh, maybe formally, uh, verbally, it seems that uh, the authority of the Pope is safe, but practically, the decisive power is given to the government. And what can be done? The Bishop's Conference does not exist. It's fake. It's only name. The government is making all decisions, selling the church. You are giving, in, in the hand of the government, the real power of, of uh, appoint, appointed bishops. Cardinal Emeritus Joseph Zen. <laughs> OK. Up next, we'll meet a woman who is lobbying to save an adoption tax credit to help more families adopt. Plus, a never seen before look at the famed Colosseum in Rome. Three Americans win the 2017 Nobel Physics Prize. Rainier Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne were awarded for their contributions in detecting faint ripples flying through the universe. The prize was announced today by Sweden's Royal Academy of Science. It comes with a $1.1 million prize. Congress is preparing to draft legislation on President Trump's tax reform proposal, but children who could be adopted may be impacted. And that's because the adoption tax credit could be cut. Joining us now is Michaela Sims, a representative of the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys. She's working to preserve the adoption tax credit, and you are a mother, proud mother, of two adopted children. Welcome to the program. I am. Thanks, Lauren. Tell us how this adoption tax credit could be cut. Why is it at risk? Sure. So, as I'm sure you and your viewers know, Congress is considering massive tax reform, and the concept is to lower the overall rates. And when you do that, you you have to offset it somehow. And so, th there there is a belief that most or all of the tax credits will be cut, including the adoption tax credit. So that means if I adopt a child, I could have had a credit on my income tax. Correct. And now, if this reform would go through the way it currently stands, I won't get that credit. Correct. And is that similar to claiming a, just a child? Is it the same as if I have three children, I claim them on my tax form, and um, that's my credit? What you're saying is if one is adopted, I can't claim them. Two different things, and they're both good questions. So it's important to note that so far we only have the framework of tax reform. So a lot of the details have yet to be filled in. But so far, from what we've been told, most of these credits are, are going to have to go away. And one, the child tax credit is something that every family in the country would get, a child tax credit. No matter what, if no they're adopted what. or not. And they are talking about possibly raising that as well, which is a great thing. And I'm sure many of myself included, many people think that would be a great thing. The adoption tax credit is different. That is specifically designed for families who are considering adoption. To encourage them to do it because Absolutely. it will actually help them a little bit. You're right. a devout Catholic, attended Catholic schools from kindergarten through law school. Tell me how your faith has helped you in your cause to help the adoption community. I know we have a picture of you and your beautiful family. Oh. There they are. Uh, so, I, you know, it's, I guess it's, it's, it's impacted me in a number of ways that I probably don't even realize because I think to a certain extent it's just so ingrained in me to help where I see a need to help. But as I've gotten older and certainly after adopting Sam and Jack, my husband adopted and I adopted Sam and Jack, I've been more purposeful and I just see a need. I work in and around Washington so I have a skill set that allows me to know how Congress works. And so I just saw a need. There's not a whole lot of people. There's a lot 
lot of people who want to help families, but where companies might, you know, everyone in, in, in corporate America knows that tax reform is underway right now, but families aren't so in, plugged in right exactly. now to that. And so if they want to learn more about this, um, where do they reach you? AdoptionTaxCredit.org, actually. All right, there we go. Michaela Sims, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thanks for having me. Finally tonight, visitors to the Colosseum in Rome can now enjoy even more of the ancient amphitheater. The newly restored fourth and fifth levels of the Colosseum are set to open for guided tours next month. Included in the visit is a connecting hallway that has never before been open to the public. The top of the ancient site offers priceless views of the stadium and, of course, of the eternal city. I hear it opens in November. Who's coming with me? For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless you.